Right. Uh, okay, first of all, I'd like to actually echo uh, Andrea in thanking Alex for organizing this very wonderful workshop. If this is a, if this uh, co-organizing a workshop is always like this, I'm, I want to do it much more often, actually. And I'd also like to thank uh, Jairo for actually giving us this uh, great opportunity to, to actually do this here, and of course the Humboldt Foundation and University of Mainz for paying the bills of the, of the workshop. Um, all right, so I actually put in my title a um, long time ago, and I think I made it maximally vague. And so uh, <laughs> looking at the program, I actually had to think what I actually wanted to talk about. And uh, what I decided to do is that I'll actually um, explain to you how, or, uh, how the magnetic uh, imaging technique that is closest to my heart uh, works. And then I will show you two examples that will, will show you like what is actually, uh, what it can be uh, used for. All right, before I actually start doing that, I actually want to start by thanking um, lots of people. First and foremost, the, the MOLA group that taught me everything I actually know about scanning squid microscopy. Uh, this is uh, Cam right here, and I'd like to thank uh, Julie Bird, who's actually uh, the graduate student who, who trained me on the instrument that I used uh, or that I, that I worked with um, during my time at Stanford. And I also want to point out Eric Spenton, uh, with whom I've done um, uh, all the measurements together on, on 2D TIs. And then uh, all the different materials came from um, many collaborators inside and outside of Stanford. Uh, the Merck Telluride um, quantum well devices that I talk about um, were fabricated in the lab of uh, David Goldberg Gordon, and back then also Marcus was still there. Um, and the material itself came from the group of Lawrence Molenkamp at Würzburg. Um, the Indian Arsenal Gallimant Timonite devices came from the lab of Rui Rui Zhu. Um, I'd like to thank Su Cheng Zhang and Zhao Lan Qi for many insightful discussions. And finally, in the, in the last part of the talk, I'll uh, um, show a little bit how the squid actually sees a superconductor. And so I'll be talking about uh, um, measurements on lanthanum aluminate and uh, uh, strontium titanate. Uh, and those samples came from the lab of Harold Wang at Stanford University. All right. Um, um, so as I said, I'll um, explain to you how scanning script microscopy works. Um, after that, we'll uh, use one measurement mode of, of the scanning squid, uh, namely what we call magnetometry, and we'll use that to actually image currents in this quantum spin hall regime. And then we'll actually use a different measurement mode of the squid, uh, namely magnetic response measurements, and we'll use that to uh, look at the superfluid density uh, at the um, LAOS CO interface as a function of bed gate voltage. All right. Uh, a squid is a pretty nice uh, magnetic field sensor simply because uh, the current voltage characteristic of a squid uh, period periodically depends on the magnetic flux that threads the superconducting loop. And of course, our squids in the lab look a little bit more elaborate than just a round loop with two junctions uh, um, through it. Um, actually, the squids are really stretched out pretty long and twisted back onto, it, onto themselves which makes for a so-called gradimetric design. What that means is uh, that a, a homogeneous background field in principle doesn't induce any flux in the squid. Um, most of it is anyway shielded by superconducting layers, um, only leaving a few openings, the, the, the two loops here and here, and some additional openings uh, closer to the center uh, of the body of the squid. And um, one of these loops we bring close to a sample, so that's our pickup loop. And then these uh, additional openings, we bring actually so-called modulation coils close to that, to them, uh, which allows us to um, um, feed additional flux into the squid so that we can run them actually in a, in a closed feedback loop, uh, meaning that the total amount of flux in the squids is constant at, constant at all times. Uh, so we get a very uh, linearized um, measurement signal, actually. An additional feature is this um, single turn coil, and that actually comes in when we do magnetic response measurements. Uh, we call it the field coil. We can run a current into it, and what that does is, first of all, it doesn't induce any flux in the squid because of the uh, symmetric arrangement that you see here, 
but it does apply a small magnetic field to the sample that we measure, and so if the sample has a magnetic response, the pickup loop will sense that. All right. Um, here you see an optical image of how, the, how our, uh, maybe not the most current generation, but the last uh, generation of squids uh, look like. Um, these were made by Martin Huber um, at the facilities of uh, NIST in Boulder. And you get directly a sense for the scales. So um, here you have a zoom in where you see the, the pickup loop uh, with a field coil around it. And the pickup loop is three to four micrometers across. And that dimension pretty much sets our spatial resolution together with actually the height at which we scan, which is about a micrometer uh, in distance. And then um, this is actually uh, part of a pretty sizable chip that you see here. And we take this chip and right now even most of the time hand polish it uh, to, a, to, a, to a, a corner like this. And then um, we take this uh, polished squid and bring it on a shallow angle close to a sample and start rastering. And that's the way we image. And here again, I highlight that there's two different measurement modes. One where we uh, use the pickup loop to just um, uh, directly measure any, any magnetic signals that the, that the sample has. Uh, versus uh, magnetic response measurement, where we actually uh, trigger a magnetic response by driving a small magnetic field into the sample using the field coil. All right. Um, what does the squid actually see? So the magnetic, uh, the, yeah? Uh, just a dumb question. Um, what is the angle between the plane of the sample and the plane of the squid? Is it, is it kind of random? Or is it it's not random. So what we do is we, uh, we um, have it actually sitting on the table, the, the scanner and we zoom in with a zoom lens and look at it, and we bring it close to the sample, and then, then there's a, some sort of a goniometer that allows us to you know, try to adjust for any tilts, like for the, for the angle you were asking about, and also the roll angle is actually also pretty important, because if the, if the roll angle of the squid is too bad, then you won't hit, uh, hit first with the tip, but you, you might just hit so somewhere with the wings of your with, with the chip. And so we do that on the table, but we don't realign in the cold. So uh, it might like, you know, distort a little bit again, but typically it works pretty well. Yeah. And so the, 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 the sh most shallow angle we can align to is somewhere between two and four degrees. And it's also a function of how flat you can make the bond wires that you use to actually connect to the squid if, you, if they sort of like have a too big of a bump, then, then you can actually uh, align very shallow. Yeah. Um, all right, so the, the squid detects magnetic flux. So if I talk about sensitivity, it makes most sense if I actually show you uh, our, our typical flux noise. And so you see a power spectral density here as a function of frequency, of course. And uh, typical numbers that we code is that at, at around 10 hertz frequency, we have a, a, a flux sensitivity of 2.5 microfarad per square root hertz versus maybe at roughly 10,000 <coughs> hertz, so 10 kilohertz, uh, we have a flux sensitivity that is about a factor of 10 better than that. Uh, and then when you translate this into sensitivities to various magnetic field sources, it really depends on geometry. Uh, and so um, when you think about um, imaging a, a specific magnetic field source, what we actually measure is a convolution of the Z component of the magnetic field convoluted with the point spread function of the squid that looks somewhat like this. Um, we can actually try to characterize our point spread function by looking at superconducting vortices because they're a pretty well-known magnetic field source. And so that gives us uh, a good idea of how our, our, our point spread function looks like. All right, and so, um, for instance, if we were to measure a single magnetic moment at a frequency of 10 hertz, uh, our sensitivity would be about uh, a few thousand bore magnetons per square root hertz. And at higher frequency, we were a factor of 10 better. If I measure um, the current through a single conducting wire, my, my sensitivity to the current uh, comes down to roughly 10 nanoamps per square root hertz. And uh, if I talk about um, detecting um, a, homogeneous, um, a, a homogeneous field threading my pickup loop, my sensitivity is more something like 0.5 nanotesla per square root hertz. So it really depends on what, what magnetic field source you actually look at, like how you, how you should think about the sensitivity. All right, and so for whom 
uh, this whole explanation was was uh, uh, not technical enough. Uh, I have I have you know the, the the full full explanation here. So what we do is we have a squid in the cold, and it looks at magnetic uh, um, at magnetic stuff. Um, all right. Um, so that brings me to the the first uh, example of what we can actually measure uh, using these squids. Um, we already heard uh, or had several introductions on quantum spin hall insulators, so I, I don't really need to, to repeat all that, but I just remind you of the most important facts that you need for this talk. Uh, a quantum spin hall insulator is a bulk insulator, but it has uh, edge modes along its edge, which are uh, spin polarized, and at each, each edge you will find two counter propagating modes. Um, However, elastic backscattering between these two modes is suppressed due to time reversal symmetry, and so you do expect ballistic transport through the edges, so each mode should give you uh, a conductance of E squared over H. Um, the reason I kind of repeat this is that I really want to point out what we'll do, though, in the experiment is um, applying a bias across a device and look at the net charge current that flows. So there are no signatures of the spin polarization in our measurements, there's also no signatures of the fact that there are counter-propagating counter modes. So we really look at the net charge current. Um, the first um, experimental re realization of the quantum spin hall effect was found in murky telluride quantum welds. Uh, murky telluride has an inverted band structure, as we've seen in, in previous talks. And what Bernevik, Xu, and Zhang um, proposed is that if you build a quantum well, out of murky telluride, so you sandwich it between uh, layers of cadmium telluride, you can actually tune the, the band structure of the murky telluride quantum well to be um, from being uh, non-inverted to being inverted by increasing the thickness of the, of the quantum well. And um, um, this also uh, um, transitions the band structure from being topologically trivial to being topologically non-trivial, so in the inverted uh, Mercatella quantum well, uh, you expect to have um, the edge modes associated with the quantum spin hall effect. And soon after this prediction, um, um, uh, the first uh, transport measurements came out of Würzburg, actually done by, by Markus, um, showing that an inverted um, Mercatella quantum well, um, once you tune the Fermi level into the gap of the structure, really has a, a, a close to quantized. Uh, conductions, uh, conduct, conduct, conductance, um, as you would expect uh, um, uh, when the system actually is in the quantum spin hall regime. And then this was, of course, followed up by uh, non local transport measurements and also later by measurements that might have some signatures of the actual spin polarization of the, of the edges. All right, we thought that it would be very neat to. Uh, uh, kind of independently of transport, verify that these edge modes are present um, by actually seeing them. And so, um, how can the squid see current? That's actually fairly straightforward. If you have a current flowing in your device, as is shown here, uh, the current actually generates a magnetic field, as is shown in red here. Uh, according to the bio Savar law, you come up with a pickup loop that's attached to your squid, and you carefully map out uh, the magnetic field generated by the current. And it turns out if the current density is two-dimensional, you can actually reconstruct um, the current density uh, from a magnetic field image. Um, and what is nice about this uh, technique is that it actually works for top-gated devices, it works for, uh, uh, also for buried devices. And now I'm losing my, my microphone. Hey. Okay. Um, all right. So the device that we looked at looks somewhat like this schematically. It's a hall bar, has six contacts. Current flows in here up on the left, uh, crosses through the device and gets recollected in the right contact up here. And it has a top gate, which is this, this yellow thing here. And the top gate is used to control the charge carrier density in, in the device. All right, um, so what you see here is a two terminal resistance of this device and it displays uh, a resistance peak as a function of top gate voltage. This resistance, resistance peak tells you two things. One is that um, if there are edge modes uh, present 
uh, in this device, then uh, they're not ballistic over their full length, just because the peak resistance of this device is, is too high for that. And that is consistent with the fact that this is actually a fairly large device. So it's 30 micrometers across and 50 micrometers long. Uh, second, uh, the peak tells you that you actually tune the Fermi level through, uh, through, the, bulk, uh, through the bulk gap. All right, so now we look at images, flux images taken at a gate voltage out here and a gate voltage out here. Um, and what you see are fairly strong features up here and um, up here in the flux image where the current comes into the device and flows out of the device. But uh, apart from that, the, the flux profiles really within, the, and within the, the sheet of the hall bar look fairly smooth. And in, in contrast to that, you see if you take an image up here on the resistance peak, that there's very strong uh, features in the flux profile. You even see like kind of like the, the outline, really the outline of the hall bar along the bottom edge here. And uh, as I told you, we can actually, um, I don't need to try to convince you from just from these images uh, that, that, that there are edge currents, even though I think I could. Um, but we can, um, we can directly go and actually uh, reconstruct current densities from these images. And so that is what is shown here for this gate voltage. Um, there's an X and a Y component of the current density. Blue is negative, red is positive. So you have a negative JY uh, here, meaning current flows down. There's a positive JX here, so current crosses over to the right, pretty much spreading out through the whole, throughout the whole uh, hall bar. And then there's a um, positive JY here, so current flows out of the device again. And if I do the same current reconstruction uh, up here at the resistance peak, I really see that the current very much uh, concentrates at the edges of the device. Uh, most of the current flows along the top edge, and some smaller part of the current actually takes a detour, uh, tracing out the bottom edge of the, de of the device. And the fact that you see the little feet here has to do with the fact that the top gate ever so slightly overlaps um, you know, with the beginning of the, of the uh, voltage probes of that whole bar. And so uh, everything that is covered by top gate is actually tuned uh, or everywhere below the top gate, the charge carrier density is actually tuned into the, into the gap. All right. Um, I can make a full movie of uh, how the current redistributes uh, while tuning, uh, tuning gate voltages. That looks something like this. Um, uh, so things to point out are maybe that there's clearly regions where you have uh, some conduction going on in the bulk already, uh, but you have... Uh, also, a substantial concentration still uh, of the current along the edges, so the edges and the, and the bulk conduction actually coexist. Uh, second, you see some, some amount of uh, inhomogeneities, and those would probably be uh, interesting to analyze more, especially if we had somewhat higher spatial resolution, and so that's maybe one thing to, to, to look into also in the future. We can, um, for series like this, we can try to analyze a little bit more by, for instance, looking at line cuts. So here you see line cuts of the X component of the current density as a function of gate voltage. We can fit each of these line cuts by a sum of three contributions, one where 100% of the current is flowing through the top edge, one where 100% of the current flows through the bulk, and one where 100% of the current flows through the bottom edge. And uh, the prefactors then give us uh, the percentage of current that flows through the top, the bottom, and the, and the middle of the device. And so there you can see that as a function of, of top gate voltage, really the, the top edge takes over most of the current, the bulk uh, uh, carries very little current, and then the, the bottom edge um, carries a smaller fraction of the current. And you can take this even one step further if you assume, or yeah, if you assume that uh, uh, the top, bottom, and bulk actually conduct in parallel, you can compute from this current percentage an effective resistance of um, the edges and the bulk, and that would look something like this. So here you see that the, the bulk resistance really shoots up uh, when you tune into the gap, versus the, the, the resistance of the top edge um, stays comparably constant. All right. Um, instead of tuning uh, gate voltage, we can also uh, turn temperature as a knob, and that, this is uh, done here with a very similar analysis, and as a function of temperature, you see that the bulk uh, 
uh, bulk resistance actually drops uh, steeply as a function of temperature, and in comparison, the resistance of the edges stays much more constant. And we really can sort of see, um, see the edges uh, up, to, up to 20, 20 Kelvin. All right, uh, and that, um, this kind of analysis is, is um, interesting um, for uh, maybe understanding a little bit better how the, how the uh, uh, bulk and the edges couple, and there's probably also uh, better uh, uh, sample designs where we, where we could um, do this much more carefully. And that might be relevant for some of the uh, scenarios that, that um, uh, explain where the backscattering in the ed edges actually comes from. It's, of course, desirable to improve really a lot of things, as, for instance, to push uh, these kind of measurements to lower bulk resistivity and to have uh, a higher spatial resolution and to maybe ch optimize the sample geometry a little bit more for these uh, kind of uh, measurements. One thing that we are trying right now, actually, and not that much for actually getting a full resistor network of the sample, but to, to actually tease a little bit more spatial resolution out of our images is to do a smarter current uh, reconstruction by actually modeling, uh, modeling uh, uh, the data with a full resistor network and then iterate over the resistor network uh, to do the current reconstruction. All right. Um, um, we've also measured um, or imaged a non-inverted sample. Of course, a non-inverted sample is tricky because it becomes insulating when you tune the Fermi level into the gap. Uh, but we have imaged it uh, while creeping up on the resistance peak, and we see no, no traces of, uh, of enhanced conduction along the address. Um, all right. Um, we've already seen um, these related uh, scanning probe measurements, so I'll skip this. We've also done imaging on indium arsenic gallium antimonide quantum wells. Uh, which realize a band inversion uh, not due to the strong spin orbit coupling that's present in, in, in mercury telluride, but due to uh, um, the fact that the electron type band and the hole type band sit in two separate uh, parts of the quantum well and can make it such that the hole type band lies above the electron type band and you get a, a effectively a band structure that looks like this and due to uh, coupling or that is inverted, uh, due to coupling between uh, the two parts of the well, you open a, a, a hybridization gap, and then the uh, quantum spin hall edges are uh, predicted to disperse between here to here and, and here to here in this hybridization gap. Um, and there were, again, transport measurements uh, in, in Rui Rui Du's group at, at Rice, as well as in uh, Muraki's group in, actually, I don't know, in Japan, but Tokyo, uh, never mind. Um, and uh, they both show uh, 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 quantized or close to quantized conduction um, in, uh, in the appropriately tuned uh, uh, quantum wells. Uh, we've done imaging on these as well, uh, uh, finding very homogeneous um, uh, current flow uh, at a gate voltage where you're clearly in the, in the uh, um, conduction band, and then very striking uh, uh, um, current flow along the edges once you tune uh, onto, onto the peak of the, of the resistance. And here you see the, the current inversion for, uh, for the indium arsenic gallium antimonide um, devices. Uh, maybe most interesting here is that we could do a, in a much more careful uh, uh, temperature dependence uh, of the uh, effective resistance of the edges, and what we find is actually that the, the effective resistance looks fairly independent of temperature over this temperature range. And um, that is somewhat surprising again, because uh, uh, you would expect uh, some temperature dependence if inelastic processes is actually what gives you, uh, what gives you uh, uh, the high resistance of the edges. And I'd be happy to uh, discuss this a little bit more, but for the sake of also showing a little bit of superconductivity in a superconductivity session. I'm actually going to, to move on. Uh, how much time do I actually have? <laughs> did, did, I, did I wake you up? Or <laughs> oh.
Let's keep going. Am I okay? Yeah. I'll, I'll run through this, and I, the the main point, the main point for me. I see. The main main. The main point for me is to really showcase what the squid can do, and I, I hope that I provoke you a little bit to like you know think about interesting measurements that one can do with a scanning squid. And then my second hope is, of course, that you tell me about these uh, these ideas. But um, all right, so um, well, uh, I, I really don't have much time to introduce the LAO SEO interface, but um, uh, if you grow. Uh, 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 Lensum Illuminate on top of uh, um, uh, uh, yeah, what is this? Titanium oxide. <laughs> Titanium oxide terminated uh, uh, SCO. You get a 2D electron system at that interface, and um, that was found in 2004. Then it was shown that uh, you actually need a, a critical thickness of at least four unit cells of LIO for this to happen. And uh, in 2007, people found that this uh, uh, two-dimensional electron system even superconducts below 300 millikelvin. And to talk about uh, um, uh, how this electron system forms, I think that would be a whole separate uh, talk. So I won't really touch on that. Um, you can backgate this interface. And uh, if you do, uh, uh, its properties changes, um, uh, change. First, the sheet resistance uh, changes, um, as you see in this trace here. Furthermore, the critical temperature of the 2D superconductor changes and even uh, describes some, some kind of a dome, as, as you can see here. Uh, the mobility changes, as well as the electron density. Um, from magnetoconductance measurements, you can uh, conclude that the spin, spin orbit coupling changes as well. And then finally, you can also see that above a um, if you induce uh, uh, more than a, 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 a critical density in the, in the two-dimensional electron system that you start uh, populating um, uh, multiple bands uh, which derive themselves from, from the d orbitals. Uh, and so the, the natural question is, uh, uh, how does the superconductivity uh, change with gate voltage beyond the fact that the critical temperature actually changes? Um, and uh, the squid is an, a nice way to actually look at superconductors. So, so far we've only used sort of this part of the circuitry, the squid pickup coil and, 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 and the modulation coils. But we also have the uh, field coil, and the field coil actually can locally apply a small magnetic field, and the pickup loop will see the uh, magnetic response. And a great example of a strong magnetic response is actually the diamagnetic response of a superconductor. And the way uh, the squid sees the superconductivity is, um, I call this uh, the ice, which uh, Ophir probably, probably still knows, because it's, I don't know exactly who in the lab made this, but um, uh, I think Tom Lippmann. Uh, but so what happens is, so what you see is the, the two black dots are, uh, you know, you looking into the side of the field coil, and then the, the field lines are the, um, field lines that are generated when you uh, run, run a current through the field coil. So that gives you uh, these fields. But then once you come close to the superconductor, there are screen, screening currents starting to flow in the superconductor uh, that, you know, uh, to a large part, uh, cancel out these field lines and so heavily distort them by that. And the pickup loop will actually see uh, this distortion. So if I plot now what the, uh, uh, the the um, signal and phi naught per amp, where um, the per amp is per amp current that I flow in the field coil. Uh, that's our signal. If I plot that as a function of height above the superconductor, you get a curve that looks like this. And this is a, a diamagnetic response. And in the limit that the superconductor, so this plot, is, this, this animation is actually for, for a very strong superconductor with a very small penetration depth. In the limit, though, that you're above a, a, a 2D superconductor and the per length is a lot longer uh, than the, the dimensions of your squid, um, there's a very uh, simple relationship between uh, the flux that you measure uh, as a function of the height above the superconductor. So by uh, fitting an approach curve like this, you can actually uh, obtain uh, the per length of your 2D superconductor and in turn, the per length is um, proportional to one over the superfluid density. So um, that's why I can show you um, 
um, superfluid density uh, as a function of gate voltage now. So we've done this uh, on a five unit cell LIO STO sample. And um, first of all, as a function of gate voltage, you see how the critical temperature changes here, um, where, no, this line here is pretty much limited by how small a signal we can detect or by our noise floor. And then you see here how uh, at the same gate voltage points the superfluid density changes and it pretty much monotonically increases as a function of gate voltage. The uh, superfluid density that we find is roughly only 10% of the, of the normal, um, of the density of the uh, normal state carriers which is uh, consistent with, um, with the superconductor being in the, in the dirty limit, and also consistent with the, with the mobilities that, that, um, that you find uh, uh, for these samples. All right, uh, now we can actually look at, um, so first of all I should point out, um, so we can also look at the superfluid density at each gate voltage as a function of temperature. Um, the plot left here is that curve only for, only for one uh, gate voltage and what that is supposed to tell you is about how bad our systematic errors are in actually determining, determining um, uh, the superfluid density. So the, this, this gray area is pretty much our systematic error bar. Um, however, um, uh, the relative measurement of, uh, um, uh, so um, uh, the so the relative change of, a, of the superfluid density is very accurate, actually. The error bar on that is, is much smaller, but the, the error bar on, on putting an absolute value on all these, uh, on all these points, that's pretty much uh, described by this uh, gray shaded area. All right. Um, um, so we can uh, uh, look at the superfluid density as a function of temperature at all different gate voltages, uh, and this looks somewhat like this. But what is striking is if we normalize uh, all these curves uh, to the value of the superfluid density that we measure at the lowest temperature that we can get to, uh, and we normalize the temperature axis uh, to the critical temperature, they pretty much collapse all on a, on a single curve. And that, um, and that can be quite nicely fitted with a uh, phenomenological S-wave model, wh which, you know, would, uh, uh, which has two fitting parameters where uh, that would be um, uh, given by these values if we had a we weakly interacting uh, clean BCS superconductor and the fit gives us somewhat these values. This A uh, in particular actually makes that uh, the superfluid density increases somewhat more steeply um, with temperature below the critical temperature. Uh, I think what is um, and also that the curve flattens out at very low temperatures tells you that you're dealing with a fully gapped uh, superconductor. But I think the most striking fact is actually that uh, the overall structure here doesn't really change with gating. And that is, that is maybe a little bit curious given that all kinds of other properties actually change as a function of gate voltage uh, uh, in these samples. Of course, this comes with a caveat that this is all you know, within you know, the limits how accurate we can measure. All right. Um, with this, I'm actually at the end. I hope I've convinced you that scanning squid is somewhat a nice tool to look, uh, uh, to look at different materials. Uh, uh, last part is a little bit of self-advertisement uh, to, I guess that, that's a, maybe a Cornelian thing that we need to like, uh, show you all these pictures of waterfalls. <laughs> so Cornell is really quite beautiful. We have a lot of uh, really, really fantastic waterfalls in the area. Uh, luckily for me, there's also really, really nice and new uh, uh, physics building. Um, uh, this is um, my group. These two will leave me after the summer. This is a little bit the lab. Uh, where we right now have a uh, Montana workstation running and hopefully in that a scanning squid sometime soon and then sometime in the fall uh, uh, the delusion of refrigerator will arrive and we can go to much lower temperatures. All right, and that leaves me with uh, acknowledgements again and uh, thank you.